Podcaster Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieCasserJane.com. And thank you so much for joining me. I am Hallie Casser Jane. Today on the Hallie Casser Jane Show, two women, two memoirs, two extraordinary lives. Joining me at my table, award-winning writers, Elizabeth Nunes, author of Not for Everyday Use, and Joanna Rakoff, author of My Salinger Years. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to the Hallie Casser Jane Show, Talk Radio. Refined Minds. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com on Blog Talk Radio, and be sure to visit us at our newest home on iHeartRadio. Today, the Hallie Kesser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Halle Caster Jane Show. Hi, this is Halle Caster Jane, host of The Halle Caster Jane Show, talk radio for fine minds. Join me November 16th through 23rd at the nation's largest book fair, the 31st Miami Book Fair International in warm and sunny Miami at Miami-Dade College. Mingle with 400-plus authors from around the world, including Patricia Cornwell, Dave Barry, John Dean, Philip Margolin, Anne Rice, Elizabeth Nunes, and Joanna Rakoff. Listen to the authors read their own words, answer your questions, and autograph your books. For more information, visit MiamiBookFair.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. See you there. Hello, I'm Hallie Kesser Jane, host of the Hallie Kesser Jane Show. Join me Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern when I talk with the great artists, writers, musicians, politicians, and celebrities of our day. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is talk radio for fine minds. Tune in live or listen to the podcast at HallieKesserJane.com. Elizabeth Nunes, Ph.D., immigrated to the U.S. from Trinidad after completing high school. She is the award-winning author of eight novels, four of them selected as New York Times Editor's Choice. Among her books, Boundaries, nominated for the 2012 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Fiction, and Anna in Between, awarded the Penn Oakland Award. Nunes is a distinguished professor at Hunter College, where she teaches fiction writing. Her latest book, The Memoir, not for everyday use, is an astonishing achievement, tracing the four days from the moment she gets the call that every immigrant fears, the burial of her mother, Nunes tells the haunting story of her lifelong struggle to cope with the consequences of the sterner stuff of her parents' ambitions for their children and her mother's seemingly unbreakable conviction that displays of affection are not for everyday use. So you are a brave soul, Miss Elizabeth, I have to tell you, to travel down those dark recesses of your heart and mind. I mean, am I correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes courage and perhaps even curiosity and the need to make sense of it all to write a memoir. Memoir writing is so special. Talk to me. Well, I think it takes time. It takes a lot of time. I couldn't have done this when I was younger. I couldn't have done this when my parents were alive. I would have been too self-conscious, you know, not you know, not wanting to offend them, afraid that I may be saying something that they would not like. When I couldn't have done this, as I said, when I was younger, because um, maybe I didn't understand it. I, I didn't fully understand their relationship and their relationship to me. And also it helped being a novelist. I've had a chance to write eight novels before the memoir. So I had a chance to do that kind of thing. So it, it all came at the, at the right time. So I guess that, that follows with this question then. So how did you discover it was time to write it? You know, I whenever I start a novel, or start a book, I, I, I 
don't know what it is. Generally, it is a question that has been haunting me for a long time. And I would say with the memoir, I had been very angry for a very, 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 very long time about the way the Catholic Church had curtailed my mother's life and as far as I'm concerned, her happiness. It had so made her, it had made her so afraid of hell. <laughs> And, um, and and punishment for, for, for sinning. And, and particularly where it really affected her is with sex with her husband, having children. I mean, in the Catholic Church, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't use artificial birth control. And I was very aware, even at a very young age, that my mother was not really cut out to be a mother. <laughs> <laughs> that she probably could have dealt with two children, but not 11. And I I just remember very much each one of her pregnancies, how angry she was. Of course, she never could articulate why she was angry. And she never articulated that she was angry because she was pregnant. But everything she did was a manifestation of her anger. I mean, she would yell at us. She had these horrible viricose veins on her legs. And my mother was a beautiful, really, really beautiful woman who was aware of that she was beautiful. Um, she, in a way, was vain. She dressed. She liked to, you know, be well-dressed. And so, you know, she had this pregnancy all the time. And my best memories is my mother throwing up, vomiting, mm, 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 like mm. all day or from morning to night. And I think that the nausea that she suffered and the vomiting that she had was a manifestation of her anger, you know, that this is what. And she couldn't do anything about it because she believed that if she used artificial birth control, she'd go to hell. Oh, God. Uh, right, literally, know, oh, God, my right. Father, so sex was there. <laughs> right, exactly. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go, let's, let's go backwards for, for a second. Let's travel down your road a little bit. You were born and raised in Trinidad, okay. for those who don't know. Yeah. Let's discuss your dad a little bit. Uh, give me a little background mm. on who he was and, and what he gave, yeah. what you think he gave you most. And your mom. Well, yeah. Well, in our house <laughs> where we were growing up, we thought our father was a genius. He was just the smartest man that God ever created. And my mother supported that. And he certainly projected that. And he was very, very well respected in the community. What I discovered when I was writing my memoir was that my father suffered from insecurity. And you would think that with a man who thought he was smart and that everybody thought he was a genius, why would he be insecure? Well, it was that he was the darkest of his nine siblings. His father was a white, one white parent, one black parent, and his mother was one white parent and a mulatto parent. So there was, there was a lot of range of colors among his siblings. My father turned out to be dark, and the darkest of his siblings. And in Trinidad, people don't like to say this, we don't have a racial, you know, racial discrimination as such. What we have is color discrimination, and that's the currency, hmm. um, color discrimination. So and to, to give you a sense of how he was the darkest in that family, he had a brother and a sister who both passed for white their whole life, one wow. in Canada and one in England. Hmm. And so that's where he was insecure. And I didn't know this until I wrote the memoir, which is one of the great things about writing, is that you really discover things you didn't actually know you knew. And so my father, what seemed to be humility and modesty, which was a contradiction that at the same time, he was so brilliant and wanted us to know he was brilliant. He also was a man of the, of the world. He didn't, he didn't have airs about him. Um, I don't know how you can. Yeah, no, that says say it. That. Yeah, right. He was a humble yeah, man. He, he, he was humble. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't have, he, he was humble. Um, he adored my mother and until the day she died, <laughs> which is how the memoir begins where I find out he was pretty much saying he would go in her place, you know. Right. He adored my mother, but he was also unfaithful to her. Yeah, we're going to talk um, about that in a minute. Uh, and your mom, I, I think you just gave us a pretty good uh, understanding yeah. of who she was as a woman and this whole thing about Catholicism. Mm -hmm. I find that fascinating. This whole, it's a theme that runs through a lot of people who grow up Catholic and whose parents are Catholic. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, I don't know what yeah. it is about that Catholic church, but mm -hmm. strong beliefs and, and the choices that people are forced to make because of those. I'm going to use the word indoctrination. I'll bet you wouldn't mind that either. No, would you? no, I, I wouldn't mind that. And also, you know, in other religions, 
uh, and this may be a good distinction, in other religions, the the congregation read the Bible themselves. We never read the Bible. Really? uh, when, When you came to church on Sunday, the priest read a section of the Bible and interpreted it for you. So there's that whole mystical kind of authoritarian position and indoctrination that the Catholic Church has, that you get your information from your priest, that you yourself don't read the Bible, you yourself don't read the the New Testament. Fascinating. And so I, really, right, so yeah. it's given to you, it's not something you come to as a result of that yes. kind of mm-hmm. thing. That's mm-hmm. fascinating to and me. It, yeah, and it's given to you side by side with fear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, I get that. It, right. Fear is a major part of it, that if you make a wrong, you know, and they all these very various levels levels of sin that could send you into the various positions of hell. Yeah. So so let's go back to, on this on your mother, because I think this is really the question. Your mother is not an emotionally driven woman. Fascinating. Not a what? An emotionally driven woman. She's not an emotional woman. Talk to I me. I wouldn't say so. No, okay. Maybe I'm putting oh, it. Go ahead. But no, no, your question. No, no. I was curious because that's the, the sense that I got from reading the book, which is not that she didn't have emotions. There's a difference between somebody who, who has emotions. It's how she displays them. How both of your parents maybe displayed it to you. They focused on... On you guys being the best that you could be, correct? Yeah, I I wouldn't say my mother wasn't an emotional person. In fact, she probably. Was. I mean, the anger is no anger that is you, right emotion. Right, I get so that. That anger manifested itself in all kinds of ways, which could cause disruption. I mean. There is a scene where I say she threw a pot, and my father said, when he came home too late. Right, right. And then I I have a place where she pulls the tablecloth from under the dishes because she's angry with him. Maybe I'm saying but misdir- would, misdirected but, emotion, but go ahead. That's Yes, but one, I, as I said to you, I discovered in the in the writing of the memoir that my father was propelled by his, that his insecurity triggered a lot of his behavior, but it was an insecurity about color. For my mother, it was an insecurity about class because my mother married, my father belonged to a pretty much a uh, very educated, very cultured, very distinguished family in Trinidad. And my mother had ambitions for all of that, but she herself did not, you know, her father was an alcoholic, a brilliant man, but he was never able to uh, achieve what he could do because he was an alcoholic. And her mother had had two children out of wedlock. And when she married my grandfather, she was pregnant with another man's child. So my mother came out of that, but she always wanted that kind of class that my father's family had. So for her, that insecurity came from class and from him, it came from color. And there they were. And those are the two big problems in the Caribbean, <laughs> class and color. <laughs> right. And you bring and that up. right in my family. Exactly. And yeah. I'm glad that you just said what you said, because my next question is about this. Uh, Trinidad is mm-hmm. clearly mm-hmm. A, a part of this memoir. It's a character in the memoir. Yes, yes. And that's one of the things I just love about this book. So talk to me a little bit about growing up in Trinidad and what that gives you. Well, Trinidad, the name itself, Trinidad is a Spanish name, which will already means Trinity, which would already tell you (laughs) that we were once colonized by Spain. Our capital is port of Spain. So we were once colonized by Spain. But there's a lot of French influence in Trinidad. And if you look at the names of towns in Trinidad, they're like Blanchichel, Saint Souci, a lot of French influence. And that's because when the Spanish had it as a colony, they didn't pay much attention to Trinidad. They were interested in trying to find El Dorado in, in South America. And the French came with their slaves. So they brought a certain kind of culture. And then, of course, we got colonized by the British. So there is all those three dominant European cultures just playing side by side, the Spanish, the French, and the English, and we speak English. And then the other peculiar thing about Trinidad, which is unique in all the islands, is Trinidad is just seven miles off of Venezuela. We can see Venezuela from Trinidad. And we actually are an island in the Orinoco, in the delta of the Orinoco River. But more than that is that we were actually part of the Amazon forest. And in some kind of Teutonic shift, Trinidad broke off as an island. And what that says is that the flora and fauna in Trinidad pretty much resembles the flora and fauna that you would find in the Amazon. It's unique for that. 
a National Geographic many times would come and study that in Trinidad rather than go to the Amazon. A lot of that has gone away because of hunting and fishing and all the various things that uh, affect ecology. But when I was growing up, my father used to hunt all the time. I mean, he almost got killed by a mackerel snake, which is our word for a boa constrictor. Could oh. you imagine thinking of a boa constrictor in a Caribbean island? <laughs> and there it was. And there it and was. We had we had deer. Could you imagine deer in a Caribbean island? And that's because we were just part of that. So Trinidad is very unique. And I'll tell you two more things about Trinidad, three things about Trinidad, which makes it really, really unique. One of them is we share in the oil belt in Venezuela. So Trinidad it is the richest of the Caribbean islands because we have oil marine under the ocean and all across the south of Trinidad. And in fact, America imports 75% of its liquid gas from Trinidad. Um, We have a lot of manufacturing as a consequence of the oil. And the other thing is, the second only natural asphalt lake in the world is in Trinidad. So Walter Raleigh corked his boats in the Pitch Lake in Trinidad. And the third miraculous thing is that Trinidad lies in terms of latitude in the doldrums. So we don't get the effects of the hurricanes. We get Terrible rains, but no hurricanes. So it's a lucky island. It's a it's a it's a magical place. <laughs> it's, it's, That's it's a what it is. Place, but it's rife, of course, for corruption. Sure. Because once you have all those riches there, corruption follows. Because of our proximity to South America, we end up being a strainer for drugs. Before the drugs come to America, right, right. they come through Trinidad. The, the, the other thing is that Trinidad has a very high percentage of Indians from India and Chinese from China who came as indentured laborers after the emancipation, after slavery ended in 1834. So there's all that big mix for cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> Were you happy in Trinidad? Could you go back and live in Trinidad? I can't go back and live in Trinidad. One, because I've lived so many years here. And two, because there is a kind of freedom and independence that a woman has in America that I wouldn't have in Trinidad. Still to this day. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, I have sisters who live a pretty good life there, but it, I don't think they understand the extent to which we have that kind of, I'm speaking as a woman, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, not necessarily as a black woman, just as a woman. <laughs> We have a lot of freedom and independence, and and especially in New York. I guess I guess I'm speaking about a New Yorker. New York, California, probably the same. I mean, I can pick up myself and go to the movies by myself. Right, right. And New you could York. not do that. If in I Trinidad. did that in Trinidad, the whole town <laughs> would be talking about me. I get it. I get it. Let's go okay. back to this. I want to talk to you about the Sterner stuff. You were raised, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, these are. I mean, your dad was very successful, and. Yeah. And these were two people who honestly wanted great success, not only for themselves, but really wanted their children to have Correct. success. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not a bad thing, but it, w- it could be difficult by the same token. So talk to me about the Sterner stuff. Yeah, by all accounts, we look like a very successful family. My father was very successful of all his siblings. He did really well. By the time he retired, he was a director of Shell Oil. And until he was in his 80s, there were companies that had him in retainers for his advice. So he did well. He also did very well with his children. Um, The sternest stuff comes where I said of his insecurity about color. It was not only proving that he was good, he could achieve more, but that his children, that a Nunez with black children, would have succeed more better than anyone else. So we were pushed, particularly my brothers. My sisters, all of us were also encouraged, but as an insurance against a bad marriage. The good thing about my father was that he was a feminist, and he really believed that we should not go in a marriage or stay in a marriage that wasn't good for us. And so as insurance for that, he made sure that we all had a university education. Whether we used it or not, he just wanted us to be able to support ourselves if something happened. And it turned out to be a very smart, smart, smart thing he did. Oh, absolutely. So on, so on the surface, we look successful. I have five brothers, three are physicians and really, really good at what they do. One is a successful businessman and one is an actuary. 
my sisters are lawyers, they are midwives, they have two of them have their MBAs, and then there's me. Um, I'm a university professor as well as a writer. So in, in that sense, superficially, we achieved that goal. But I think at what price? Doing a stuff at what price? I did not do the same with my one son. My one son has done well. He's gone to graduate school, but I didn't do it in the way my parents did. I think for them to achieve that, I feel they withheld a lot of the emotional support we needed. My view right now is that what human beings need and what children need above everything else is love. And if they have love, if they are given love, if they are given demonstrative, demonstrable evidence of love, then their potential will flower. And my parents were always so scared of us not achieving and pushing us in that way. Apart from my mother's frustration of having all these children that she couldn't handle, I think we all suffered, all of us suffered from, from that need. You came to the States. Uh, uh, some people, that wouldn't be a big deal. But I think coming out of the environment that you came out of, to come here and start a life for yourself, yeah. take, took mm-hmm. a hell of a lot of courage. I, you know, wow, yeah. how fabulous was that? And and I have to assume that, you know, that courage uh, was instilled in you uh, by your parents and their desire to get you where you needed to go. And mm-hmm. you got here and you got where you needed to go. You married. And I want to bring this up because your marriage didn't work. Unlike mm-hmm. your parents who were married, how long? They were huge, long, long, how many years? seven years. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And then you get married and it doesn't quite go so well. But you know, it's interesting to me. I wonder if that isn't a function of our times as much as anything that, you know, our generation isn't willing to endure. Put the, up. Let's mm-hmm. put up that with the struggles. Is, is, yeah. is that I, true I, for you? Yeah, I think that that's true. And there, there goes along with what my father wanted which was have your education. If your marriage doesn't work, you can take care of yourself. But you're correct. That sterner stuff helped me. That sterner stuff that I was brought up with helped me. That when I took a long time to get divorced, a long, long time to actually leave my marriage because I came from such an intact family, not only from my parents who had 67 years of marriage, but my grandparents had 60, almost 70 years of marriage. They died in their late, almost 100, both of them. And they had a long and very close marriage. So I came from that, from that kind of background on my father's side. So the idea of breaking away from my husband was just something I couldn't very hard to do. But when I did do it, that stern of stuff that I was raised with helped me to keep focus and keep going on. My father used to say all the time to us, you are not a bat. When you fall, you don't fall on your head and get knocked out. You're not a bat. That's what happens to a bat. It falls on its head and gets knocked out. You fall on your feet. You get up and you go. And so that's what I did. I I think I would have liked to have known your dad. Some of the things, though, that happened, I mean, the the, the only thing about that Cerner stuff is, and that anger that you talked about that your mom had, all of that, how do you think that affects how you relate to other people, to men in your lives, to in general? Because, right, It it has a massive effect on one, no? Yeah. I think I am always surprised to find out that people say they were intimidated by me because ah. I don't see myself <laughs> as that. I, I just don't see myself in that way. Can I tell you something, Elizabeth? But, I can relate yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't know when that. you come and across as strong. Know, yeah. I mean, I, 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 there's no way I think of myself as some, you know, having accomplished anything like that. I see myself as still going along in my road, <laughs> my road to being whatever it is I want. And maybe I'm a little further on the road than you are, but we are both on the same road. Right, right. So, so the effect of that is, yes, people say that. I think it has probably affected my relationship with men in that way. And it's some men. Although it's I cook and clean and do all those. <laughs> do you? <laughs> those, those traditional women things. But, you know, I, I think I paid a price. I'm, I'm, I'm happy where I am. Still, I know I paid a price for this. Well, you I should be I happy where you are. You're one of the most revered writers that there are. I mean, God bless you. Some really, really wonderful work. I have three things I still want to talk to you about, so stay with me. Let's talk about the relationship between mothers and daughters, because I think this is really important. Yeah. I mean, people are always talk about fathers and daughters, and surely there's something very special about that relationship between a father and a daughter. But the profundity uh, uh, of, of the relationship between a mother and a daughter that goes to the very yeah. heart of a girl and what becomes, yeah. hear me, the soul of a woman, I think you are primed to talk about that 
because of what happened between you and your mom. Can you give us a minute on that? Well, I wanted to have a daughter for that reason. And I remember when I was in, so I never wanted to find what the gender of my pregnancy was. And when I looked at my arm, when I found out I had a son, I was so disappointed. <laughs> I wanted, you know, I adore my son, but I wanted to have a daughter for that reason. I think what it is in the relationship with a daughter and a, a mother and a daughter is, I think, I think that there are all kinds of emotions running at the same time. Some of them are the negative ones. I think the mother is probably a little jealous, particularly in a marriage. She may be jealous of the daughters, that the father likes the daughter, or, what, or even jealous of the, what the daughter is able to do. I think there is the resentment. There is, oh, it's hard. I think it, it, the I'm thinking about my mother right now. No, I hear you. Um, I hear you. And, 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 and things got better towards the end, as you can see in the, right. the memoir. I understood better. But I think the mother is hard on the daughter. It's harder on the daughter than she is on the on her sons. And I think she's harder on her daughter, and it's a mixture of tough love, because one, she knows what she's been through, and she's got this daughter ready for what is going to happen to her. And so in a way, the mother tends to lash out at that daughter in, you know, say things to that daughter, horrible things to that daughter that if she had her senses on, she would not have said. Right, right. Um, and I think of some of the terrible things my mother said that I don't think she meant them. And I don't, uh, but more than that, I don't think she realized how it would affect my life and how it affected my life all the way through. For example, I don't think I'm an ugly person. Ugly? And, you're gorgeous. What? <laughs> well, <laughs> But my mother told me I was ugly uh, for a long time. Yeah. And part of her telling me I was ugly was one, her disappointment, perhaps, mm. in me. And two, her getting me ready for, you know, that beauty alone won't get you anywhere. But when she said those things to me, I was young. And it takes a lifetime. It takes more than a lifetime to remove that from you. And it affects all your relationships. Absolutely. I would say it affected my relationships with men because on the one hand, what they saw was somebody who was successful and someone they thought was attractive, but that person did not think she was attractive and did not think she was successful. Interesting. And, um, Interesting. The same, it, an insecurity like your dad had, right? Fueled so much of who yeah, you are. Yeah, but it's coming from a different... Right. I understand. It's just, it's just terrible. You know, it... You know what I would say? I would say that a mother, when she has a young child, has to realize what a precious object she has. And that everything she says and does is going to be imprinted on that child and it's going to affect the way that child acts. No matter what the child, no matter what the daughter says to her, it's there, it's going to affect her and it's going to affect her relationships in the future. So a mother has to be careful. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a chance to have a daughter to correct that. Well, I think your book uh, speaks to the many daughters of the world. The last thing, at the end of the day, after the abject honesty and the brutal dissection of your life and your parents' influence on you, their daughter, I have to ask you if you think that you were too hard on your mom, on your parents, or listen to me, Elizabeth, is your story that you were too hard on yourself something that you inherited from your mom? Hmm. Why are you asking me that question? <laughs> because I think you're um, a very... You, well, now, listen, I'm going to answer your answer, your question because I think you're a very wise woman. And I told you before we went on air how impressed I was with this book. Well, you gave you. You, you gave me so much. I want you to give it to the audience. Okay. You, you asked me, was I too hard on my parents in the novel or in life? It, or, I mean, it, in the memoir. In the memoir. Or were you too hard on yourself? Probably I was hard. Yes, someone said that to me. Someone said that in the no, in the memoir, when I compare myself to my sisters, I am hard on myself. And and you know, it's the legacy I have. Mm. It is the legacy I got from when I was young. And I had been hard on my mother for a long time until when I started to write the memoir. I understood why she acted the way she did. So the fact is, we can understand why somebody acts that way towards us. However, even though we understand it and we empathize with that person, at the same time, that has nothing to do with the actual effect that had on that child. So my poor mother didn't realize, and, and I say my poor mother, I don't think my poor mother realized, and she did towards the end, but it was too late. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. She was in her late 80s. She didn't realize how this tough love and this withdrawing of affection 
and this not saying I love you and giving what a child needs more than anything in the world, love. She didn't realize how that would affect her daughter's life. And it and didn't only affect my life, it affected all my sister's lives, all of them. Of course, of course, absolutely, <laughs> unquestionably. It's a story of maybe forgiveness, but I'll tell you what, Elizabeth, this is truly a story of love. Thanks, lady. Fabulous. Thank you. I think it is to a story of love. I've been speaking with award-winning author Elizabeth Nunes. Her book, Not for Everyday Use. For more information on Elizabeth and all of her work, visit her website at www.elizabethnunes.com. Joanna Rakoff's novel, A Fortunate Age, won the Goldberg Prize for Jewish Fiction by Emerging Writers and the L. Reader's Prize and was a New York Times Editor's Choice and a San Francisco Chronicle bestseller. She has written for the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Vogue, and other publications. Hailed by critics, Rakoff's new memoir, My Salinger Year, is a poignant, keenly observed, and irresistible funny coming-of-age story of a girl who at 23, after leaving graduate school, dared to pursue her dreams of becoming a poet. A move to New York City, a job as assistant to the storied literary agent for J.D. Salinger, a love affair, well, sort of. Joanna Rakoff's book, My Salinger Year, brilliantly captures the pre-digital world on the cusp of vanishing of literary New York in the late 90s. I have to tell you, this is just a great read, Joanna, and, and a book that proves that one never quite knows where their dreams are going to take them. So it begins with your dream to become a poet. Talk to me. Yes. Well, I, you know, I was, um, I, I couldn't, it's, it's funny that you say that because I couldn't quite um, articulate that dream. So I was a kid, you know, who grew up in this very conservative Jewish um, suburbs or kind of exurbs of, of New York City and was from one of those very typical families. My parents were the children of immigrants and they really wanted me to go you know, to medical school or law school or that kind of thing. They just assumed that I would and everyone in my family did. And I was such a sort of good, obedient child that I, I couldn't even articulate to myself that um, I wanted to do something different. And and in a way, that's how I ended up um, having this year that's chronicled in the book, because I was, um, you know, I, I went to college and studied English and did a lot of writing and sort of was kind of fumfering around, as my mom would say. I love that word. I haven't heard that word since my mom said it. Great uh, word. Right? Yes, yeah, true. That's like her favorite way yeah. of describing my life. Or I was, um, I was kind of feeling at the edges of... Um, sort of becoming a writer. And I had all these friends in college, you know, I went to Oberlin and a lot of my peers were kids from Manhattan or LA whose parents were, you know, working writers or worked in publishing. And for them, um, you know, working at the New Yorker or doing something like that or becoming a novelist was, was real. And I had a couple of friends who just right out of the gate published books. But for me, I couldn't even articulate to myself that I wanted to do this. It seemed too scary. And I was, I knew that I would sort of have the kind of, um, 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 a lot, I would have to really pay for it with my, my parents. And so I went to grad school, um, you know, just to get a doctorate in English literature. And I, I hated it. I, um, I, I wrote on Sylvia Plath. And um, there's, you know, maybe because I felt suicidal, uh, trying to uh, make myself into an academic. <laughs> but but I, um, I, there's this moment in her journals where she's in grad school, and she says, I don't want to write papers on, um, or I don't want to grade papers on, on these novels and poems um, that I love. I just want to sit and greedily read them for myself. And I read that and I thought, oh God, that's how I feel. I just, I, I want that to be my job, the reading and writing of, of the things, not the critiquing it or reading student papers on it. And I knew at that moment when I read it that I was going to drop out and this was never going to be my life, that I was never really going to be an academic. But that was kind of a safe way to be a poet, you know. And so I ended up dropping out and taking this job in publishing because that seemed another safe way. Another safe way. That, that, to be a poet that, without that, really... Right. The book opens when you're 23. But tell us about the younger Joanna. Who was she? Were you always the poet? Were you always the writer? Were you always the one who um, kind of went down a different path? I was. I really was. I, um, I'm trying to remember when this happened. At some point in my young adult life, I, 
I might have even been in high school. I think I was in college and home on a break. But I ran into my second grade teacher, Mrs. Viss, who had been my favorite teacher <laughs> um, at the grocery store. And she, I was with my mother and she said, um, she gave me this huge hug and she said, are you still writing poems? And I had no memory of writing poems or writing anything in second grade. Wow. You know, and now I have my own kids and I see how young second grade is. And I thought, wow, but I, I was at that age. Um, you know, I was devouring books that I now understand were way um, beyond what the other kids were reading. And I sort of understood it then because my teacher, that, that same teacher, part of the reason I loved her was she would let me choose the books that, sh- that we would read aloud to the class. And she would sometimes let me read instead of her at story time. I like this teacher. (laughs) But the other kids, of course, hated me and I had no friends. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) So I was. I was always, always that kid. You were always, Um, always that kid. I remember someone who hated me once saying, I know you were born in a bookstore, but, you know, uh, like people in America like football. I was like, I'm sorry. I just... But this is so funny because you know what? You wound up at the perfect place for a kid like you. You know, a young woman at this... This crazy, the agency, you call it. I love the agency. I mean, what a, what an, un, a unique <laughs> place you landed on that yes, first job of yours, nice right? <laughs> um, and, and, but I have to ask you before we even get into this, because she calls the book The Agency um, and, and doesn't really reveal names, which I don't quite didn't get because all I had to do Google was uh, th- was to Google and I found out you worked for Phyllis Westberg and Harold Oprah. Yes, Associates. it takes one second to Google it and find out, <laughs> so what, and I knew that. Yeah, I, but, so why? I mean, I, I, it was intriguing as you called it, though. I like you know the way that you did it, it actually worked, but you didn't do it because it, it was fun to say the agency. You did it because um, I did it because it was a stylistic choice. Um, you know, I, I signed the contract to write this book, um, with, with some reservations. I, I really, um, am more of a novelist. I don't write so much about myself. And, um, I had this year, um, after signing the contract where I thought, oh my God, what have I done? And I couldn't quite settle on a point of view for the book, a tone and a style, and um, I, I sort of wrote and wrote, and I also did a lot of interviews. Um, I interviewed everyone I worked with. And, um, and then one day, I, I, I had the kind of, not a 100% full realization, but a semi-realization that part of what was holding me back was that same sort of good girl rule-following rule tendency that I was writing about these people who were who are alive for the most part, you know, not Salinger, but I wasn't right. even so concerned about him, but you know, my boss and these people I worked with and who I really had loved. And I think it's kind of clear in the book that it's sort of written from a place of, you know, fondness and affection. I, I think of the word I would affection, use. Affection. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's very true. And I loved this job. Um, you know, people have said to me, Oh, this book reminds me of the devil wears Prada. And I think really, because my boss was not, mean and horrible to me and i i learned so much from her and liked her but anyway i listen that's not a bad comparison it happens no, not to be true. So true true i mean if you read the they're, they're very different stories needless to say but it's not a bad yes. comparison i take it <laughs> if that many people read it that's awesome but right. um but so then one day i um i just so i i have this realization and i decided to take all of the names out including the name of the agency so my boss became just my boss. Um, the character in the book who's known as Don just became my boyfriend. Um, there's a character in the book who's referred to as my college boyfriend. And I had previously used his real name. I just called him my college boyfriend. That one stayed. Um, there's a character named Hugh. I called him um, the office manager or something like that. I now can't remember. And um, the, there's a character named Jenny. And I just called her my best friend. Um, so I, I took all the names out. It was and an in interesting choice so, because you know what that does? So it, it sort of freed me up and the tone and style and everything that you see in the book now just came to me. Yeah, that was like the, I know you, the, as uh, I write too, and as, as you get, there's always that one thing that does it and then the key is turned in the lock and then you can just soar after that. But I liked it because, uh, you know, you, you name people, we have an image. And it, it made me have to think a little bit about who these people were, you know, and what they were like yes. in my own mind. It was, it was, it's an interesting choice. I, I, this woman, though, I mean, and this agency, a throwback 
to another time. But uh, there's something, what, nostalgic about a mink and Hermes clad boss and a plush wood paneled office. And the book industry at one time was so magical and dramatic. Yeah. And you captured the last of that, I have a feeling. What do you think? I, you know, I do, I'm not 100% sure, but I do think so. I mean, I, I remember going to other offices. You're, there's, it's not all in the book, but visiting other agencies. Um, I remember going to meetings at the old random house offices and that kind of thing. And they did feel, you know, very different than, um, offices today. You know, right. they're just, there, there was a little, a lot more sort of quirkiness and sort of room for, individual personality is to kind of thrive. Um, I, I think though that um, maybe what I mean to say is that there was kind of a patina of glamour that is maybe not so much there today, that things are a little bit more corporate um, in terms of people's presentations of themselves, you know, at the Everything office. Everything is more corporate today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and so, you know, a lot more sort of everything in cubicles and um, you don't see people sort of kind of trailing in in their whiskey mink coats with a cigarette. Certainly right, not. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's too bad because that was great drama. That was just so much fun. So let me ask you this. You were, well, let me tell you, you're the perfect ingenue, which is a word we don't even know anymore. But the way you were described in the early days of this, you know, whole uh, thing that you did there is you're like, you're the ingenue. Do they even make women like you? Girls like that anymore. I mean, I know that men and women are young men and women, women go to New York to fulfill their dreams, but I don't know, there's a certain charming naivete in the, in the young Joanne and the 23 year old. And you certainly knew how to dress for success, darling. Your mother taught you well. <laughs> That's so true. Yes, she really did. I'm very grateful to her. <laughs> That's a great scene in the book, folks. That's why you need to pick this book up. So you wind up working in this throwback of a literary agent's rather, agency, rather a strange place, as we've just uh, said, where they still use typewriters and dictaphones, and you don't have a clue how to type. <laughs> get this job. You're not as naive as I make you out to be. You, you lied to get the job with the skill. Is that, is that, didn't I read that in the book? Yes. Yeah, so I was coached to do so. I would <laughs> never have done that on my own. Never, ever. The good girl in you, right? Um, I'm a pretty terrible liar. Yeah. Yeah. I just like, I don't quite have that gene. Um, but you know, I was told by a headhunter that, um, I should simply say that I need to type. And I guess this headhunter, I don't know if it's completely clear in the book, but um, my boss had been searching for an assistant for months and this agency, this um, placement agency had been sending her, you know, young girl after young girl. And they had just been kind of crushed by my boss <laughs> who, you know, she would say, can you type? And they would say, no, I can't. Or, or like, because everyone as, as the headhunter lady said to me, she said, you know, people of your generation, no one can type. So you just need to lie. And I think she was so fed up by this point. She was like, just lie. Because I, like, I need to get this lady an assistant or like the world's going to end. You know? I love that. I love that. And you didn't ever see, I had never seen a dictaphone, but you learned how to use that too. And I mean, what is it? I bet you when we say the word dictaphone, half the world has no clue what we are talking about with a dictaphone. I thought that was just hilarious even to hear that word. It's not one I've heard in a long oh time, right? $18,000 a year, which yeah. I think somebody told me equivocates to about $28,000 a year. That actually sounds like not bad for New York, you know, when you're first starting a job or whatever. But your dad wasn't real thrilled. You were a glorified secretary, right? Is yes. the one who said that? I love it. But you yeah. trudge on and I love that. So you brought up the boyfriend, Don, before we go into the meat of all of this. I do want to talk about that because I do think this is such a wonderful coming of age story. And you know what? One thing we've all probably learned, I'm sure, Joanna, that you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I definitely learned that. <laughs> this guy, yes. Don, talk to me. <laughs> I like the first one, the, the college one. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, yes, well, he's he's back. I'm sitting in our bedroom right now. <laughs> yeah, I write. <laughs> um, but um, so Don, you know, was kind of the stereotypical, just terrible boyfriend 
that every, I think not every woman, but a lot of women and especially a lot of women um, who have kind of bohemian inclinations or romantic ideas about relationships have to get out of their system. So he, you know, was, um, at the time he seemed ancient to me, he was 30, um, to my 23. (laughs) And he was very aware of being older than everyone in this milieu we were in. Um, it, it slowly, I, I slowly came to understand he was a would be, um, novelist. He had been, he had written one novel that he had shelved. Now he was working on a second novel. Um, endlessly he had been working on it for years and it was a parable about, you know, Mo- the modern day class struggle and um, called fellow traveler, which you may know means like someone who is not a member of the communist party, but who, um, you know, sort of helps them out and, um, and adheres to their value system. Um, and um, he was, you know, incredibly sort of narcissistic and <laughs> pompous to, to such a degree that if, if you can believe this in, in my initial draft of the book, there was more of him and, there were scenes in it that my editor said to me, you know, we have to cut these out because no one will believe that this really happened. And, and I was like, what? And then I, of course, said to her, but there are actually worse scenes that I didn't even put in because I didn't think anyone would believe they really happened. He was, he modeled himself on Norman Mailer. He was constantly looking at other women and, you know, assessing their attractiveness. You know, he was just... You he know, was and, a piece of work is what he was. But you know yes. what? If that was your only one that you went down that path with and you learned that lesson, good for you. I think that's great. I'm, some of us, it was a little rougher. <laughs> we had to not go. We didn't learn the first, the second, or the third time. All right, let's get into the heart and the meat of this, this just delightful story. Okay, J.D. Salinger. The client, the literary icon. First, for those who might not know, you got it because not everybody knows who J.D. Salinger is. So let's just give a quick who is J.D. Salinger. J.D. Salinger is the um, legendary, iconic um, author of The Catcher in the Rye, um, most famously, but also um, these stories um, about a a huge family called the Glass family. So Franny and Zoe, nine stories, um, and so on. And um, he only wrote a few books, um, a handful of stories, and then um, disappeared. I mean, didn't disappear, but he retreated to a farmhouse in New Hampshire and refused to speak to reporters and um, was very sort of curmudgeonly and allegedly very eccentric, but no one really knows for sure. Um, And so he was the most famous client of this agency. And by the time I started working there, he had not given an interview in more than 20 years. And what else? What else can I tell you about well, I think, him? <laughs> I think, no, I think he'd been pretty good because generationally, I'm not sure where we are on that one. But, but what is interesting yeah. is, is that you had never read anything by him. And right. there you are um, in this agency and he's, he's a client number numero uno and, and uh, you're going to have some interaction with this guy. But you hadn't. So talk to me when you, uh, my my favorite, and I guess the most notable of all of the books, of course, is Catcher in the Rye. When you read it, what'd you think? I loved it. I loved it. I, you know, the thing that I left out, I realized I should say in my little mini bio of of (laughs) Salinger is that he is I possibly, you know, the best selling American author of all time. So these books have sold millions and millions and millions of copies. They've been translated into every language in the universe, every language possible. And, um, and so it, it did, I mean, now the world is somewhat different. Um, but back when I took that job back in the mid nineties, you know, and certainly when I was in high school and probably when you were in high school too, like everyone had read The Catcher in the Rye. I mean, I, I did not know anyone. It was a rite of passage, read. right? It was a rite of passage. It was, yeah. it was a rite of passage. And I, I, you know, all of my friends had read it. It was, um, I mentioned in the book, you know, it was on the syllabus at my high school. And the only reason that I wasn't assigned it was because I had this very, uh, this sort of maverick English teacher who was like, I'm throwing out the the New York state syllabus or whatever it was. (laughs) And I'm going to teach Bruce Springsteen lyrics in Maya Angelou poems. And so we didn't read it. And, um, and somehow I, I never did. Um, and so maybe, um, so I guess I should mention here that one of the things that happened over the course of that year is I was tasked with answering Salinger's fan mail. Well, yeah, we're getting to that. I wasn't going to um, That's such a great part so, of the story. Sure. That is the and, story. Yes. I, <laughs> yes. And so it was through, so I was not interested in Salinger. You know, as I mentioned, I was a doctoral student. I th- fancied myself someone interested, you know, in much more difficult 
uh, fiction than Salinger, who was this best selling writer. And I thought if he was, if he's so popular, how good could he be? You know, you know who else is really popular? Danielle Steele, but I'm not going to read her, you know? Right. So, so I, I just had wanted nothing to do with it. But then in answering his fan mail, I, I really saw the ways in which his work, you know, had defined people's lives and affected them in these truly profound ways. Um, and I became very curious about it. And I also got to know him too. And he was so wise and so kind and lovely. And there were all these other writers, you know, that I spoke to on the phone who were nowhere near as well known and they were not as kind and wise. And lovely. Yeah. And I think it's interesting uh, on a number of levels, which I want to get into with you. One is the fact that, that he's so kind, so wise, and that wasn't what anybody I think expects because of the PR around this guy, if you will, as to, you know, the recluse, the, you know, he withdrew, uh, you know, he didn't want to talk to anybody. So I, that was really uh, eye opening your, your uh, descriptions of, of how you found this guy to be. I, I remember the first time he called and he was on the other phone with Jerry, you freaked out. <laughs> yes. I, I would have did. too. I, I have news for you. I don't know what I would have done. But your job became, just to make this clear, was to answer his fan mail. And you were given that task with, you were supposed to fill out a decades old pro forma kind of, you know, there you go. And Joanna Rakoff, being Joanna Rakoff, said, wait a minute. No, there's more. These people are writing these letters. I need to answer the letters. And you started writing your own replies. Talk to I me. <laughs> I love that. Go, tell yes. me. Being, as you said, extremely naive and <laughs> idealistic, I just thought these people were pouring out their hearts to him, you know, and writing to him. There was a pretty large percentage of these letters that were about you know, really awful things. Um, their children dying um, was a big one. Um, there, there's a lot of death in Salinger's fiction. And, you know, you may recall that, um, and listeners may recall that part of the plot of The Catcher in the Rye has to do with Holden Caulfield's brother dying. Um, you know, in his, he has these visions of, you know, saving children, you know, catching them um, as they fall off, fall off a cliff and what have you. So, uh, you know, um, there, a lot of people wrote about death, about tragedy, and it was very difficult for me um, being this young, idealistic, overly sensitive kid to send back this kind of harsh form letter that was designed to make people not contact the agency again, you know, the letter was essentially like, goodbye, Go away, right. <laughs> never call, do not follow up on this letter. You know, we're done. Like, <laughs> Just go away. And, and so I, um, you know, I started at first just started softening it a little bit and trying to make it sound a little bit more contemporary because it really did sound like the kind of hyper formal diction of 1963 when it was drafted. And, but then I started, um, you know, um, writing much more, comprehensive, um, meaty responses to people, which was not always the best thing to do because they actually were sometimes, I thought that I was doing them a kindness by writing them personal letters, but they often were actually really upset that someone had read their letter and that person was not J.D. Salinger. And they didn't care what I had to say in response to their letter, you know, about, you know, their child dying of leukemia. <laughs> they they wanted J.D. Salinger's response. So in a way, it would have been kinder to them to just send them this harsh letter. Yes and no. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an odd thing. I was thinking about the fact that all of these people are writing their hearts out. And just that in itself tells you what a connection they had with this writer. This because and, and who was this writer? I mean, you know, it's kind of an out there concept. And that they would take the time to write and, 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 and voice what they are. And there you are, kind of a voyeur. Voyeur. <laughs> <laughs> really? yeah, it's you know, true. it is true. And it's kind of a, a weird thing. But you know, there's such an incredible lesson in this, because there's first, what, what you were getting out of your reading these letters, what was happening to Joanna Rakoff? Well, I suppose I was, you know, partially simply just learning about the world, and the, the many, many variations on human experience. You know, that was a big part of it. Um, I was sort of seeing all these people's lives sort of laid bare in front of me. You know, the letters came from all over the world. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of letters came from veterans um, of the Second World War. Um, so not, my dad was sort of a year or two too young to, or maybe a few years too young um, to, to enlist um, and had instead 
you know, um, enlisted for the Korean War. But I, I still, uh, you know, that was he was very much defined by the war, and I felt this very strong attachment to these these men writing letters who were to Salinger, who were mostly saying, you know, I. Um, I witnessed these horrible things. You know, my friend died in my arms, which is, of course, what happened to Salinger. Um, and, but, and so I had learned about all this um, in school. And, but reading these letters made um, it so vivid um, for me. And, and all of this, it made, basically, it was sort of almost like if the world had been black and white, it became technicolor. Uh, <laughs> nicely said. You know, um, so, but ultimately what happened, what the, the result of all this was that it made me into an actual writer rather than someone who wanted to be a writer. It made me into an actual writer as in the letters that I wrote to these fans were the first pieces of real writing as opposed to crappy, fraudulent writing. They were the per- first pieces of real writing that I did. Um, the first pieces of writing in which I could kind of jump off a cliff in the way that you need to do to write a short story or a novel. You need to just go for it. And I, I think because I was writing to a real audience, I was able to do that without feeling self-conscious in the way that I had previously and, when I was just writing for myself. I love that because it really, look how it, look at, look at how it plays, how he wrote and how this one man who became this writer affected all of these people and those people affected you and if you affected them, I, it, it's just really, it's a, it, when you think about it, it's just a gorgeous story of a lot of give and a lot of take and, and a lot of change and a lot of growth. Um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Uh, I wish we had a whole lot of time more to talk about <laughs> it. But before I go, I just want to say, let, I'm going to ask you to sum up that year in that bohemian literary agency with that bigger than life boss of yours and and that contact with that just extraordinary man and all the people who adored his work so much bottom line for you share all the things that year just sum it up oh god well you know the truth is that it was really fun you know it was <laughs> i loved where it was a fun year um as i said it was um, almost as if this world that had been kind of gray, um, kind of suddenly became bright for me. Like all these, um, things revealed themselves to me about the way humans operate, but also about New York. Um, you know, I lived outside of New York and known it from this strange perspective because my whole family was there on the Lower East Side and the Upper East and Upper West Side. And I, but I was always a little bit of an outsider and it was so much fun to be in New York as a young person and sort of have it become truly mine, you know? Um, so anyway, if I had to sum it up in one word, I would say it was fun. (laughs) Hey, that's a heck of a way to end the conversation. It was fun. I loved it. Thanks so much, Joanna. What a great story. All right. I've been speaking with Joanna Rakoff, author of the best-selling memoir, My Salinger Year. More information about Joanna, her work, and her appearances, be sure to visit her website at joannarakoff.com. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Casser Jane Show. The Hallie Casser Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Casser Jane Show and you will find us. Of course, podcasts of our shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieCasserJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. Oh, and while you're at HallieCasserJane.com, don't forget to visit my blog to read my latest musings. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Casser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the 
Hallie Kasser Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasserJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Kasser Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Kasser Jane. It's a wrap.